time of year, we begin looking toward Christmas a little more. And they started this year a long time ago, but we here. Uh, usually, the last Sunday in November is the first Sunday in Advent, except this year. December has five Sundays. And I forgot that. So I was planning on starting the Advent, and I'm still going to start the Advent today. We're not going to light candles or anything. But what I, was, what I want us to do is look at what Advent is. Look at the history of it. So um, I titled this Advent Revisited. I want us to understand a little bit. We, we get to doing things in the church. Every church celebrates Advent. Uh, we all do it just a little differently. Like I said, this year Advent begins next Sunday. It begins the fourth Sunday before Christmas, Christmas Day. Uh, the nearest Sunday to November 30th. And it ends on Christmas Eve, officially. Uh, we don't have Christmas Eve service here, or Christmas Day service, so we don't include that day when we celebrate Advent as far as lighting the candles. Um, we work it out a little differently. Now the word Advent means coming or arrival. The focus of the entire season is the celebration of the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, in his first Advent, his first coming, and the anticipation of the return of Christ, the King, in his second Advent. So Advent is, is a lot more than just marking uh, a 2,000-year-old birthday. It is celebrating a truth about God. The revelation of God in Christ, whereby all of creation might be reconciled to him. This is what we're doing during this season of Advent. Now, in the middle of this double focus, on the past, his first coming, and on the future, his second coming, Advent also symbolizes the spiritual journey of individuals and congregations. As we affirm that Christ has come, that he is now present and that he will come again. And to acknowledge that provides a foundation for what we call kingdom ethics, or a biblical worldview, or in our church, holy living. We live between the times, between the first and the second advents. And God calls us to be faithful stewards of everything that he has entrusted to us, all of creation, and then personally, your life, your family, your children, your grandchildren, your finances, your time, your very life. We're stewards of all these because God has given them to us. The church celebrates God's inbreaking into history, in the incarnation, and anticipates a future consummation. I'm picking up a little feedback here. God's inbreaking into history. It's called the, the incarnation. And then the future ending, when Christ returns at his second coming. And during that time, it is our responsibility as a people of God that we are commissioned to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We know this is the great commandment. That is what we are to be doing while we live our lives here on earth as we await the second advent. See, this advent is marked by, by a spirit of expectation, anticipation, preparation, longing. For most of us, there's something inside of us that we know there, there's something more. We know that this world is not the way God wanted it. There's a yearning to be delivered from from the evil of this world. It was first expressed by the Israelites when they were in bondage in, in Egypt. They cried out to God for freedom. Today, it's those who, who have experienced injustice in a world that's still under the curse of sin. Yet we still have, have a hope of deliverance by a, from, by a God who has heard. 
He heard the Egyptians, or he heard the Jews when they were in Egypt. He hears us today when we cry out to him. It is that hope, however faint at times, that God, however distant he may seem, that brings to the world the anticipation of a king who will rule with truth and justice and righteousness over his people and in his creation. The Jews were waiting for it then. They were waiting for this Messiah to come. They misunderstood it a little bit. But they were excited about this second coming. Well, his first coming for them. Part of that expectation was anticipating a judgment on sin. A calling of the world to accountability before God. We feel that today. We look around and we see all the, the, the evil and the sin and we want God to, to take care of it now. We long for God to set the world right. Yet the prophet Amos warned us. The expectation of a coming judgment at the day of the Lord may not be quite the day that we think it is. Because we see God taking care of all sin, but that same light that he shines on sin, he shines on us. The penetrating light of God's judgment on sin will shine just as brightly on God's people. This time of Advent is one of expectation, anticipation, a longing for God's actions to restore all things and vindicate His righteousness. It's celebrated as a time of joy and happiness as we await the coming of the King. The scripture that I read this morning Seems a little odd for a Christmas scripture. But it talks about the anticipation of the second coming, the second advent. Let me read it to you again. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like the ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil, olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out, meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. While they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. And then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. And then this morning to us, So you, too, must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Advent reminds us that we, we need to be excited. He came first as a baby, to die for our sins, and he's coming back as a king to rule. The profound joy of the bridegroom's expected coming, even though we don't know the exact day and the hour. And a warning, be prepared, be ready for when he shows up. The prayer of Advent is still, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. We are captive Israel today. We're the ones who are captive on this earth. Christ is coming to set us free. We are set free when we accept him as our savior. But there is an ultimate freedom that has not yet come. Now, during Advent, we light five candles. Uh, historically, the, the primary color of the, of the uh, sanctuary is purple. We don't do that here. A lot of churches don't do that much anymore. The color represents penitence and fasting, as well as royalty, because of the, the king of the advent. It's also a color of suffering that's used during Lent and Holy Week. And this points to an important connection between Jesus' birth and his death. The nativity cannot be separated from the crucifixion. The purpose of Jesus coming into the world, of the word made flesh, and dwelling among us is to reveal God and His grace to the world.
through Jesus' life and teaching and through his suffering, his death, his resurrection. To reflect this emphasis, originally Advent was a time of penitence, seeking God's forgiveness of fasting, which is what is done during Lent. Uh, during the four weeks of Advent, the third Sunday kind of turns a corner. It becomes a, a day of rejoicing. Rejoicing that the fasting is now over. The shift from the purple of, of, of penitence to a pink or a rose color that reflected the lessening emphasis on that and more emphasis on celebration. In recent times, the celebration of Advent has even changed some more. Colors have changed. Now, the Eastern churches still have a lot of emphasis on penitence and, and uh, fasting. But here, the whole time has changed into a time of celebration. Celebrating the birth of the Messiah. Celebrating his, his return. Even the color has changed. A lot of times it's now blue, which is what we have here this morning. Uh, blue, which is um, an, another symbol of royalty. It's also a symbol of the sky. Uh, in anticipation of the impending announcements of the king's coming. It symbolizes the water of Genesis 1, uh, a new creation. Does, doesn't eliminate our need to prepare ourselves. That's the overall umbrella of Advent. Preparation. We prepare ourselves for God. For His... I'm going to say indwelling. Maybe that's not quite the right word. As He begins to work in our lives. See, Advent is just like Lent is a time where we begin to focus on Easter on the death and burial and resurrection of Christ at Easter, the Advent season is a time for us to begin preparing. Not just for the Christmas tree and all the presents, but to prepare our hearts for what God is doing. A lot of liturgical churches will have uh, corporate prayers where people will read together. Prayers of confession. Those are needed. As we begin to look to God, as we begin to see what He wants to do in us and how He wants to change us, you know, we get so caught up in the season of Thanksgiving and Christmas and get caught up into all the commercialism, we forget what it's really all about. And that's why Advent is so important to us. Because we take the time to refocus, or we should be taking the time to refocus. Now, the colors red and green that are so popular at Christmas have nothing to do with Advent. Now, Advent is not commanded in Scripture. It has become a tradition, a way that we can refocus our thoughts. So the red and green symbolize more of, uh, usually more earthly things. But even there, the, the evergreen of the holly is used to symbolize ongoing life. This life that Christ brings into the world. Um, come Friday, you can join us as we do decorate the church. We put up the greenery. And we do that here. There's nothing sacred about it. It's just a fun thing to do. Here we have the Advent wreath, uh, the candles. This is how, in fact, this, this will probably change before next Sunday. I'm not pleased with the looks of that. But the Advent wreath, it's an increasingly popular symbol of the beginning of the church year. Now, in the Jewish calendar, they have two New Year's days. Uh, for us, we kind of look at this time as, as a beginning of, of a, a new church year. But not necessarily always. The circle of the wreath reminds us of unending life. Just like a ring during a wedding ceremony symbolizes the unending love, the eternity of God's love. We have five candles 
There's four around the, the outside and one in the center. Uh, the wreath is symbol is symbolic in a vehicle to tell the Christmas story. And there's all kinds of different interpretations as we tell the Christmas story. This is one of them. Again, the circle of the wreath reminds us of God himself. Eternal. Endless. His endless mercy and love has no beginning or no end. The green of the wreath speaks of the hope that we have in God. The hope of newness, of renewal, of eternal life. The candle, candle symbolizes the light of God coming into the world through the birth of his son. The four outer candles represent the period of waiting during the four Sundays of Advent, which also symbolizes the four centuries between the prophet Malachi and the birth of Christ. Uh, the color purple or blue, like I said, we're using blue. Um, it'll be lit. The first one will be lit next Sunday. The scripture will be read. It will be a devotional. A prayer will be offered. That's tradition. That's what we, what we do. Uh, we'll start usually with the blue one. The pink one or the rose-colored one is always lit on the third Sunday. Uh, the light of the candles, the light itself becomes a reminder that Jesus is the light of the world. That he comes into the darkness of our, of our heart to bring us newness, to bring us a hope, to bring us new life. It also reminds us that we are called to be the light of the world to those around us. And again, the progression of the lighting of the candles symbolizes our waiting. The candles are lit during this uh, four-week period, uh, the four Sundays that follow that precede Christmas. Each one shows that darkness is being driven further and further away. Whenever light appears, darkness flees. The shadows of sin are falling more and more away as this light spreads into our life. The flame of each new candle reminds us that something is happening. And yet we see more candles and know that something more is coming. And finally, the light that has come into the world is plainly visible as, as the white Christ candle is lit in the center. And we get to rejoice over the fact that the hope and promise of long ago has been realized and has been promised. The first candle lit is traditionally a candle of expectation or hope or preparation to remind us to prepare ourselves during this time. It draws attention to the anticipation of the coming of the Anointed One, the Messiah, that story weaves its way throughout the Old Testament from Genesis clear through. God's people were abused by power-hungry kings and led astray by self-centered prophets and priests, lulled into apathy by half-hearted religious leaders. There arose a longing among them for, for God to raise up a new king, one who would show them, bring them back, to the God who led them before. So God revealed to some of his prophets that he would not leave his people without a shepherd. This promise they understood as an earthly king. God had more in mind. We know that the world today is not fully redeemed. We are not fully redeemed yet. So we again, with expectation, with hope, await God's new work in history. This second advent, when he will completely redeem all that he can. There will still be those that will choose not to. But for those of us who choose to be redeemed, he will come back and fully redeem us at some point. Now, the remaining three candles of advent may be associated with different aspects of the advent story. Uh, Depending where you are, what time of the, the, the uh, not just the yearly cycle, but the, 
churches have, have a, a bigger cycle. But here at our church, we will be celebrating love, joy, and peace. First candle we light will be the candle of preparation, preparing ourselves. The second candle will be that of love. The third candle almost always is that of joy. And then the fourth candle we light will be that of peace. The center candle, the white candle is called the Christ candle. Uh, sometimes we'll use a, a large white candle. I found this a couple of years ago. It holds a white candle in it. And it's got the, the baby Jesus. Just to remind us of what was going on, what it's all about. Because this is what the white candle stands for. The Messiah, the birth of the one that God promised. The central location of the candle reminds us of the, the incarnation is, in, is at the heart of this season. Giving light to the world. This is the true reason for this season. Not family. That's a side benefit. Along with all the presents, that's all side stuff. The whole reason for this time of the year is to celebrate the coming of the Messiah. See, if, if our hope is only in our circumstances, if we get so hung up in our circumstances and how we define them, we define them as being good or bad, we're always going to be disappointed. That's why we need to hope not in circumstances, but in God himself. He has continually, over a span of 4,000 years, revealed himself to be a God of newness, of possibility, of redemption. The recovery or the transformation of possibility in your life. Things that you cannot even begin to imagine that God wants to do in your life. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. This God has things that you can't even, cannot even begin to think about that he wants you to do. Yet it all begins in the hope that he will come again into our world to reveal himself as a God of newness, a possibility, a God of new things. This time of the year we contemplate that hope embodied in a newborn baby. The perfect example of, of newness, the potential, the possibility. During Advent, we groan and long for that newness with the hope, the expectation, indeed the faith that God will once again be faithful in our circumstances. You know, the only reason he's not faithful in our circumstances is because we don't see him there. We don't allow him to enter. He hears our cries. He knows our longings. And he wants to fulfill those. One thing I've seen over the years is that those who have suffered and still hope understand far more about God and about life than those of us who have not. Maybe that is what hope is all about. A way to live, not just to survive but to live authentically among all of our problems of life with a faith that continues to see possibility where there's no present evidence of it just because God is God. That is the wonder of the Advent. Father, we thank you for this time of the year. And as we take the time now just to pause and, and allow some of these things to, th to sink in, to quit taking this season so, so lightly, to understand that it is a time of, a concentrated time of preparing ourselves, allowing you to come in and, and show us our innermost secrets. Maybe just to remind us of them but a time when we begin to not just look at the past, the coming of the baby, God in flesh, 
Not just now, as, as, as Jesus, as you live in heaven with us, as you have given us your Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, to convict us, but also looking to your return. The worship team come back up. Would you stand, please, as we sing, I am your child. Sometimes I ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. I ask you to do that this morning. Not because there's anything sacred in it, but it helps us to begin to focus more on God. It blocks out all the external stimuli that, that would draw our mind away from God. I want you to take a few moments. Capture all your thoughts. Focus them on God. And I want you to thank him. Thank him for all the things that he's done for you this past week.
want you to take a few moments now and thank him for how much he loves you and how much you love him. we stand before him, as we humble ourselves before him, take some time now to ask for forgiveness for something that you may have done or, or maybe something you didn't do that you know he wanted you to. Pray for your family and your friends. Pray for your neighbors. Our city. Let's pray for our nation. Fathers, we stand here before you. We brought to you our prayers. Brought to you our praises, our thanksgivings, but also there's things in our hearts that, that concern us. Our family, our friends, our neighbors, our city, our nation. You are still God. Even though sometimes it may not seem like it, when we look around and we see all the evil in the world, that's because you have given us the freedom to choose. And so many people are choosing sin instead of you. Father, I pray for each one of us here that, that we will make an effort every day to spend a few moments with you, at least a few moments. And that we will grow that into a time, a time that we spend with you in, in loving you and listening to you. And that we will allow you the freedom in our lives to lead us and guide us. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. As we continue on our worship, you may remain standing or be seated. Let's start with singing the song, We Bow Down. Lord, you are Lord of creation, Lord of my life. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all Lord you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down and we worship you, Lord.
Enjoy.